future nurses, it's Christine from Nurse in the Making and today we're gonna talk all about lab values. Lab values are some of the most crucial things you need to know as a nurse while in nursing school and for the NCLEX. The point is you need to know these values. Lab values give you an insight as to what the body is doing and what area of the body is hurting. I'm going to talk through the most common lab values and give you some memory tricks to help you remember them. You can follow along with your lab value flashcards. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel for weekly videos, daily nursing school questions, and all things to help you pass nursing school. First, I need to say a quick disclaimer. This medication may cause serious side effects such as rashes, sleep disturbances, and even can cause death. Do not attempt to drive or operate heavy machinery on this medication. Just kidding, not that type of disclaimer. This is the real disclaimer. Lab values may differ between textbooks, facilities, and other resources. For example, HESI, ATI, and different hospital facilities may have slightly different lab value ranges. However, keep in mind that the NCLEX and nursing school exams will give you a range that is way off. What I mean by way off is the value will be noticeably abnormal. So for example, one resource says a normal calcium level is nine to 11 and another resource may say a normal calcium level is 8.6 to 10.3. However, the NCLEX would be asking a question and providing an abnormally high calcium level of like, let's say 13, because this is noticeably abnormal and way out of range. Okay, with all that said, let's dive into the lab values you need to know. First, we're gonna cover a CBC, a complete blood count. Just like the name says, it's going to tell us the complete picture of the cells in our blood. It includes white blood cells, red blood cells, platelets, hemoglobin, and hematocrit. A normal white blood cell count is 4,500 to 11,000 cells per microliter. For red blood cells, it's 4.5 to 5.5 million. And for platelets, it's 150,000 to 450,000. Some terms you wanna know for a CBC is when the blood has a low white blood cell count, it's called leukopenia. And for abnormally high white blood cell count, it's called leukocytosis. Nursing school exams love to test your knowledge on why a patient might have elevated white blood cell count. So whenever you see an elevated white blood cell count, think infection. When the blood has a low platelet count, it's called thrombocytopenia, and an elevated platelet count is called thrombocytosis. When you see a low platelet count, you want to immediately think bleeding. Your patient doesn't have enough platelets in their body to clot, so they're at serious risk for bleeding internally and externally. For hemoglobin and hematocrit, levels vary between male and female. So for a female, hemoglobin should be 12 to 16, and for the male, it should be 13 to 18. For hematocrit, the female should be 36% to 48%, and the male should be 39% to 54%. There is a memory trick to help you remember these lab values. First, you wanna commit hemoglobin to memory. Then what you do is you multiply hemoglobin by three to get the hematocrit levels. So for example, a normal hemoglobin for a female is 12 to 16. So 12 times three is 36, and 16 times three is 48, giving you your normal hematocrit level for a female, 36 to 48%. Next is electrolytes. Electrolytes appear everywhere. These include sodium, potassium, phosphorus, calcium, magnesium, and chloride. So the normal range for sodium is 135 to 145. For potassium, it's 3.5 to 5. Phosphorus, it's 2.5 to 4.5. For calcium, it's 9 to 11. Magnesium, 1.5 to 2.5. For chloride, it's 95 to 105. Something to note about electrolytes is they have names for when they are low, hypo, and when they are high, hyper. For a low sodium level, you will hear it called hyponatremia. And for high levels of sodium, you'll hear it called hypernatremia. For potassium, it's hypokalemia and hyperkalemia. For phosphorus, it's hypophosphatemia and hyperphosphatemia. Calcium is hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia. For chloride, we have hypochloremia and hyperchloremia. So it's important to know and recognize these terms and what they mean. Now for some memory tricks. 
To help you remember potassium, you can think there are three to five bananas in every bunch, and you want them half ripe. For phosphorus, you just break apart the word. Four, like the number four, and us, like me and you, equals two, leaving us with two to four. But don't forget the point five. Calcium is my all-time favorite because it's so simple. It's just call 911. Magnesium, you wanna think of a magnifying glass that you see 1.5 to 2.5 times bigger than normal. And lastly, for chloride, you wanna think of a chlorinated pool that you wanna go in when it's super hot, say like 95 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit. Next is coagulation levels. This is especially important when your patient is on anticoagulants such as heparin and warfarin. I have an entire video about heparin versus warfarin, which you can find right here. But for now, we're gonna talk about coagulation levels. Heparin is measured with APTT, which stands for activated partial thromboplastin time. And warfarin is measured with INR, which stands for international normalized ratio. These are blood tests to measure how fast or slow the blood is clotting, and they're measured in seconds. APTT for a patient not on heparin is 30 to 40 seconds, but for a patient who is on heparin, it's 47 to 70 seconds. For INR, for patients not on warfarin, it's less than one second. But for somebody who's on warfarin, it's two to three seconds. What does it mean when these values are out of range? Well, if APTT or INR is too high, there is an increased risk for bleeding. The memory trick here is if the numbers are too high, the patient will die. If the numbers are too low, the clots will grow. So this is why we wanna make sure these lab values are in a therapeutic range because if they exert their effect too much, the patient can bleed out. And if they aren't working enough, the clots will grow. Next, we're gonna talk about the lipid panel. This test is looking at the types of cholesterol. It's a great way to assess your patient's risk for cardiovascular disease. This includes total cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL, also called low-density lipoprotein, and HDL, also called high-density lipoprotein. The normal range for total cholesterol is anything less than 200. For triglycerides, it's anything less than 150. And for LDL, it's anything less than 100. But for HDL, it's anything greater than 60. So the first three, we want low levels. However, this is different for HDL. HDL is our happy cholesterol, which is why we want high levels. And LDL is our bad cholesterol, which is why we want low levels. Next is HbA1c. This is the average blood glucose level for the last two to three months. This is because the lifespan of a red blood cell is 120 days. HbA1c is the best indicator of a patient's diabetic control and actual long-term blood glucose levels. So for a non-diabetic patient, the ideal HbA1c is four to 5.6%. If someone's HbA1c is 5.7 to 6.4, this means they are most likely pre-diabetic. And if their HbA1c is greater than 6.5, this indicates that they most likely have diabetes. A goal for a diabetic patient would be anything less than 7%. Next is the normal ranges for ABGs. This stands for arterial blood gas. It does just what the name says. It measures the amount of different gases and pH in your arterial blood. This includes pH, PaCO2, HCO3, PaO2, and SaO2. The normal range for pH is 7.35 to 7.45. CO2 is easy to remember because you just take the seven off pH and you're left with the CO2 level, which is 35 to 45. The normal range for HCO3 is 22 to 26. For PaO2, it's 80 to 100, and SaO2 is 95 to 100%. Next is values related to the kidneys. This includes BUN, creatinine, urinary output, and specific gravity. The normal range for BUN is seven to 20. For creatinine, it's 0.6 to 1.2. A normal urinary output is at least 30 milliliters per hour. Basically 1,500 milliliters a day for an average adult. 
Specific gravity is 1.010 to 1.030. Some important things to know about these values, especially BUN and creatinine, is that anytime you see an elevated BUN and creatinine levels, think kidney dysfunction. Something is wrong with the kidneys and therefore they can't filter these waste products out like BUN and creatinine, so they stay in the blood, causing elevated levels. Out of the two, BUN and creatinine, creatinine is definitely a better indicator of kidney function than BUN. Here's a memory trick to help you remember BUN and creatinine. For BUN, you wanna think of hamburger buns. Hamburgers can cost anywhere from seven to $20. For creatinine, this is the same value as lithium's therapeutic range. Lithium is excreted almost solely by the kidneys, and creatinine is a value that tests how well your kidneys filter. Now for urine-specific gravity. When you have a low specific gravity, this typically means your urine is diluted, meaning you have too much fluid in your body. You can remember the memory trick, diluted makes the numbers go down. And for an elevated level of urine-specific gravity, this means your urine is concentrated, meaning you don't have enough fluid in your body. You're most likely dehydrated. So concentrated makes the numbers go up. That's all for the most common lab values you need to know for the NCLEX and in your nursing school exams. If you want more practice with lab values, you can grab the complete lab value flashcards. The lab value flashcards cover a description of each value the normal range, and the reason for both elevated and decreased levels. It even has a spot for you to write in your own lab values if your school uses a slightly different value. I'll have the link to my shop in the description below. Happy studying, future nurses.